Hi there, I'm Dave Politis from the k and Missing Project. And this is a copyrighted broadcast from the, our channel. Well, we're here up in the Rockies. We're about uh, 50 miles from Breckenridge. And uh, today we're gonna talk about hunters. And we're gonna talk about a few things that uh, relate to missing hunters. And then we're gonna talk about some current events. One of the first things I want to talk to you about is something that just happened recently in Clackamas County, Oregon. The sheriff made a decision to terminate his relationship with the local search and rescue teams. And he made this decision supposedly because there was a lawsuit that emanated from a slow response by the sheriff. And he turned and blamed the search and rescue. Well, as someone who is an adamant supporter of search and rescue, the thought that the sheriff is just going to use his own personnel to search, it's pretty hard to believe. But as many people have brought up, if he uses just his own personnel, then he also controls the flow of information, which is concerning. If you're a deputy sheriff and you work for the sheriff, and he tells you not to talk to the press, you better not talk to the press or you're going to lose your job. And a lot of our information comes from search and rescue people that uh, see something odd, see something unusual, and they tell the reporter or they'll contact us. And search and rescue people are just like you and me. Uh, they're volunteers, they go to classes, and they're good, wholesome people that are dedicating their time to trying to save lives. And for the sheriff to terminate his relationship with them, on a personal level, it hurts. Uh, the less people you have searching for somebody, the less opportunity you have to find them. And uh, if the sheriff is the lone body looking for people, that's sad. Now, uh, one of the things that people have probably never heard before that I, I have up on the beginning of every lecture I've ever, or presentation I've ever given, is a quote by H.P. Lovecraft. It's cold up here, it's about 20 degrees. Oof. Anyhow, this H.P. Lovecraft quote, I'm going to give it to you now. And it applies to our work. It says, the most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all of its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity. And it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hereto harmed us little. But someday the piecing together of disassociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. A reader sent me this probably five years ago. And I read it and I thought, wow. The quote in their disassociated knowledge. A lot of people are razor focused. They have one interest whatever that might be, uh, planetary movement, UFOs, etc., And they stick to that and they won't look at something else. And if we are really going to understand the unusual aspects of our world, I think you gotta look at that disassociated knowledge, things that may not be obvious to you at the beginning. So as I've stated a million times, I think I'm 10 miles wide and an inch thick. I know a little bit about a lot, but I don't know a lot about some things. And that's why I don't like to make assumptions about what's happening. Because there's a very good probability out there that there's something going on and I, I don't have my thumb on it at all. So, anyhow, we're going to talk about hunters. And that brings us to Missing 411 Hunters, the book I wrote. It's a second edition now. And in the book, I wrote about a lot of different things. 
uh, all over the world, missing hunters. So the first thing I want to bring up is I'm going to go back to Mount Shasta for a minute. And if anybody watched uh, Vanished, you can watch it on Amazon right now. Uh, it was done by the History Channel, two hour special. I talked about the disappearance of Carl Landers. And Carl was a 69 year old man, disappeared May 25th, 1999. He was with a, a very good friend of his who was an importer exporter out of San Francisco and a retired American Airlines pilot. And they were gonna hike the mountain. Carl wasn't feeling good earlier that day. And Carl took off and left behind Milt Gaines and his friend. And the area between where he was and where he was going was pretty straightforward. There was no rocks, no trees, no nothing. And he disappeared. Well, in the hunter's book, uh, I talked about a hunter that disappeared on the opposite side of Mount Shasta. Jerry McKeon, he's a 49-year-old farmer from Southern Oregon. On September 21st, 2002, he drove his GMC truck from his ranch in Southern Oregon to the east side of Shasta. And he had a motorcycle in the back and he was a bow hunter. Now in the book, I've talked a lot about bow hunters and they seem to disappear and never be found at a higher rate than standard rifle hunters. Now, Jerry was described by his buddies as the optimum professional. He knew the woods, he knew how to hunt, he'd been hunting for decades and decades, and they were, it was said that he could get out of anything. Well, his buddies came and they looked at the truck and trying to find him, and they determined that he had hidden his keys where he normally had hidden them, taken his bow, and gone for a hike. Obviously looking for deer. And there was an enormous search. And you know, right about the time I start to film, it starts getting cold, and now a big gust of wind. Anyhow, two dog teams, four airplanes, two helicopters, and a hundred ground crews searched for Jerry for two weeks. They found nothing. Now, what's really weird about that is it's been 18 years where people have been around this snow park on the east side of Shasta and they never found anything. At the minimum, somebody should have found his bow and arrow, or his, or his bow. And that's concerning. Uh, when you think that people are disappearing in this area and never being found, it's not normal. And that's what I want you to think about. Now, weeks after Jerry disappeared, they brought in cadaver dogs, they flew helicopters with Flair. And this was also, you know, within that Mount Shasta range. Now, if he's not being found, where is he? Now, cadaver dogs can, spell, can smell a dead body miles away. So, not normal. Another case. Somebody sent me a note this week uh, on Twitter saying it's pretty obvious that people with cameras and cameramen don't disappear. I said, what? Uh, someone obviously who hadn't read the books. I've written about many people with cameras who have disappeared. And in fact, I wrote in the books that I thought it was highly suspicious that so many were disappearing that were considering this, themselves camera photographers. Talk about a case September 30th, 1990. 42-year-old Susan Adams and her, Susan and her hubby took a guided horseback trip into the Idaho wilderness. And they're about 20 air miles west of a place called Battle Lake way in the middle of nowhere and they were hunting and they were near a place called Moose Creek and as they went in there they were in a couple days and Susan told her husband that she was going to take her camera and do a little bird watching but she wouldn't go very far that was the quote 
and she'd been there a couple days, so she kind of knew the area. And she took off and she didn't come back that night. So all the guides and the hunters and things in camp started looking for her, didn't find anything. And the next day they went out and a mile and a half from camp, they thought, they weren't sure, but they thought they found some tracks going off trail. Well, that, one of the guys rode their horse, back, horse out uh, the eight miles, got search and rescue, and for two weeks they searched. Now, Susan's husband worked for the governor of Texas, and they rallied resources that you and I could never get. And there were hundreds of people in there looking for Susan. And she was an outdoors lady, comfortable in the wilderness. And again, years later, we're talking almost 30, she's never been found. Nothing of her has ever been found. And I have a map up in my office of uh, Idaho that I've never been made, never made public of all the disappearances in that state. And just the mere size of the state, the number of people missing, it's suspicious. There's a lot of, lot of things going on there and the vast majority of people have never been found. Now, it's true that more men disappear than women, but Susan's disappearance in amongst a group of hunters at a camp matches another disappearance that happened just in the last couple of years where a retired ranger who was working for a hunting camp went in with the, hunt, uh, the guides to set the camp up, her and her dog. The guide said they'd be back in two days. They left. They came back in two days. Camp was all set up. The woman and her dog were gone. They were never found. Suspicious. And that's two cases, two hunting camps, two women, both in Idaho. But the book is filled with stories like this. And it's not normal for canines not to pick up a scent. It's not normal for cadaver dogs not to pick up a scent. And these, these type of things, people should be keying on. And I, I know I get email from people all the time saying, oh, this person said this about you or that. It's blatantly obvious they never read the books and they never talk to people who are in the business of search and rescue. And I get email all the time from search and rescue workers saying, Dave, you're right on, this has happened to us. People don't want to talk about it because they're afraid of losing their job. They want to be a search and rescue person, but if they complain that something strange is going on or they don't think something's right, uh, then they'll get excommunicated by the law enforcement agency. Unfortunately, that's true. But uh, I'll guarantee you one thing that I will never let loose with who's feeding me information unless you say it's okay. Now since the hunting book has come out, uh, I've gotten a lot of mail from hunters about things that have happened. Uh, fascinating stuff and I appreciate it. I'm going to read you one of these letters that uh, one of the hunters sent me. It's a real good one. It says, Mr. Politis, I've read four of your books and I've been a 30-year hunter, mainly going for elk and deer. I watched your movie about missing hunters and believed that it was safe to send you my story. I was bow hunting for elk in the southern Bitterroot Valley in Montana. I've been following a herd with a few giant bulls as they moved east through two valleys. I was trying to get the wind in the right position, position and to make an approach when I was laying on a ridge line watching the group of elk below me. I saw two of the biggest bulls stopped and frozen in place looking north up the valley. The rest of the herd was behind them not moving. The two bull never moved for several minutes and were frozen solid staring at something. I couldn't see around the corner and I had no idea what they were looking at. I thought maybe they were watching a grizzly bear or a lion, I wasn't sure. After at least four to five minutes, the two bulls turned in unison and ran as fast as I've ever seen elk move up a far hillside. The remainder of the herd followed them up the hill. Here's where the story gets odd. The elk were really moving fast when I noticed something in the corner of my eye running toward the herd from the area around the corner at which they were staring. What I saw, I couldn't believe. It was an unidentified mass which you could almost see through 
like looking through saran wrap, and it was moving rapidly in the direction of the herd. This mass did not appear to have identified edges, but it did appear to be on the ground. It moved fast in the direction of the elk, and I lost sight of it as it disappeared over the same ridge line where I'd last seen the herd. I just continued to lay on the ground for several minutes, stunned in what I had just witnessed. I couldn't believe it. I've never seen anything like this or anything in the last 10 years since I saw it. I'm telling you because I think you'd believe me because of the segment of your movie, Missing 411 The Hunted, in which you identified something similar to what I observed. What really disturbs me is thinking that this mass may have been following me in the previous nine hours that I had been tracking that herd. Please keep my name anonymous. Well, just to let you know, that area of the Bitterroot Valley, the director in both of my movies, Mike DeGrazier, he's from that area, he hunts it religiously. And uh, I told him about it and he goes, hey, it makes him feel a little bit uneasy. But uh, I've, I've had many of these type of stories and to discount all of them doesn't make sense. Uh, I know some people get irritated that I actually read these stories to people and, and, and read them to you as though I, I believe and I'm, I'm just waiting on every word that they say. It's not that I believe everyone and I'm not gullible, but I'm also not stupid. Uh, when you hear something from credible people like we put in the movie, there's something to what's going on. And then someone wrote this for no reason. He never knew I was going to read this to you. This was way before I started doing these videos. So, I believe it's happening. Now, what is it? It's an unidentified mass that you could kind of see through that was moving fast. What could it be? No idea. Uh, another thing. I've had many of you write and say, oh, you should go on the Joe Rogan po podcast. And then I've had others of you make comments go, no, don't go on there. You just try to make a fool of you and make a fool of the topic. Well, to let you know, the uh, distributors of our movie, The Orchard, which is a giant company, uh, did reach out to Joe's producers and they asked to see the movie. And when we send them a link, we, we can see how many times that link is viewed on a private basis. And it was viewed a lot. They liked the movie and they probably watched it more than a couple times. But for some other reason, Joe never reached out to us. And uh, the contacts, the VP at uh, the Orchard reached out to him multiple times. Wouldn't budge. They don't, they don't want to touch the topic, it, it appears like. And that's interesting because Joe Rogan's a hunter. And the book's all about missing hunters. So maybe it makes him feel uncomfortable, I don't know. But I respect his position, he doesn't want to talk about it, I'm not gonna bother him about it. But just for the people out there that are asking, I did try to get on there. Now, one other great email. Here's this one. The attention to detail and thorough examination of you and your team that have dedicated to the cause of missing speaks volumes. It's a topic and issue that has far too long been swept under the rug. I wanted to share a strange experience myself and my wife had last summer. We live in Lee County, Florida. Our home is on a dead end street. We own four houses on that street and at the end of it. The dead end is our slice of heaven. Two of the homes are on a river that drains from the Everglades into the Gulf of Mexico. If you were to continue through the dead end and follow the river, you'd be able to get to the glades without crossing a single street. There are random houses nestled deep in the woods. Very few people, if any, travel this way. It is how one would have imagined old Florida to be. I should mention that we've had many experiences with panthers, bears, gator, and other wildlife from our homes. I should also say that these homes are used for vacation rental. We live in one and that can oversee the area, and it is gorgeous. The busy season is winter, summer is slow, it's too hot. Well, last August, we were completing a remodel and furnishing of one of our river houses. My wife had gone to play bingo, and my son and I were watching TV. She was to be home at 9. At about 8 p.m., my son and I both heard my wife yell my name. So, key on this. 
At about 8 p.m., my son and I both heard my wife yell my name. I got up to go outside to help her unload her SUV of some items that she had brought to the river house. I was surprised that she was home early. There was just one issue. Her vehicle and her were not in the driveway. She had not come home yet. I went back inside. My son were, and I were weirded out. <coughs> we had both heard her. We chalked it up that maybe a neighbor a few houses away was yelling and we misheard or misinterpreted what was yelling. <coughs> well, I guess so. At 9.30, my wife rolled in. My son and I went to bed to school in the morning. I told my wife about the earlier event. She just laughed and it wasn't discussed any further. Her and I then unloaded her vehicle. We brought some items and several trips back to the house. Two of the houses share a raised walkway that's six feet wide. You enter each house from the walkway. There are no other entrances to the house. At the end of the walkway are seven stairs that go to a patio in the river. On the last trip to the house, my wife and I stayed behind on the walkway. I entered the house and placed the stuff on the counter. I took a minute for a bathroom break. She was on the walkway enjoying the sounds of nature. <coughs> when I was done using the latrine, I exited the house, walked onto the walkway, expecting my wife to be there. She was not. I called her name, no answer. I, turned, I assumed she went back in the house where her car was parked and went inside. So I headed that way. It's only 150 feet or less, 40 second walk. When I entered the home, she wasn't there. I instantly felt weird. I should mention that I was not missing 411 aware yet. I went to my son's room and asked him if mom had been back. He said she had not. I then ran back to the other house in the walkway. There she was, standing right where she had been before I had gone inside to drop off that last load. I asked her where she had gone. She said she hadn't moved and asked me how I had gotten by her and I should have been coming out of the house and seen her, not down that walkway. She stated she had never left. Janet moved since I had walked into the house to drop stuff off. I explained that I had been looking for her and yelling her name. It was like we were both there, but not there. If she had been there, I would have touched or seen her. We were both shook up. Things that we can't understand can be heard to talk. Things that we can't understand can be hard to talk about. We don't know what happened. I wish it ended there. We have five, five Rottweilers. They needed their nightly walk. We took them down the street to do their business. On the way back home, we had a joint experience. A strange green beam of light, like a pointer laser, shot down out of the sky into the woods at the end of the street. The beam was thick and it was not instantaneous. It started in the sky and traveled 300 feet to the ground. The beam finished in five seconds in the same manner it began. The end of the sky to the ground, it was like a transporting something to the ground. My wife and I have discussed that beam at length. We have looked at videos of lasers, shooting stars. It's none of those. I'm not saying these events are connected. I've set up cameras now, have caught some interesting lights in the woods. Thanks for reading. What do you make of that? I have had hundreds of times that I've seen Photos, people talk to me about lights in the woods. Some people have called them orbs, but it's been described as moving with intelligence. In the hunted movie, there's a segment where hunters in, a, in their camp saw these things. So something with distinction and intent is obviously controlling these things. But what it is, I don't know. But when people with high integrity hunters tell us this stuff I believe it so missing 411 hunters it's an important book because these people are armed many times they know the area very very well the idea that they get lost makes no sense this is really the the point where I started to use this term point of separation two hunters go into the woods and they decide that they're gonna split up and hunt in different places or one of them says, I don't feel good. I'm going to go back to the car. You hunt. And one of those people disappears. A point of separation is key 
because something happens at this point. It's as though something doesn't want to take both people or have both people observe what's happening or I'm just speaking off the top of my head. I have no idea. But I can tell you that it's at that point where people are separated and alone that things happen. And that's why I tell everyone to hike in pairs, carry a personal locator beacon, carry a gun, carry extra food, water, emergency blanket. So this is my uh, third video. Uh, I hope it's educational. And I hope you post this on all the other sites that are stealing my name and missing 411 so that people know to come here. Follow me on Twitter at David Politis at Can't Am Missing. Thanks for watching.